Okay, uh, we're going to talk about some of the early presidents of the university and show slides of how they actually looked and how they are interpreted in stone as gargoyles in the main archway of the University of Michigan Law Quadrangle, the Lawyers Club, which was uh, completed in 18, or 19, 1924. This, of course, is President Tappan over there at the left, and this is his gargoyle in the law quad. Uh, President Tappan was hired by the Regents, the old Board of Regents, in uh, 1852. He was living in Europe, had been living in Europe for a long time, and uh, really uh, had an international reputation to hire this gentleman to come all the way from Switzerland to Ann Arbor to begin his career anew. That was a real coup for uh, the University of Michigan. The university at that time had about 64 students. And when uh, he finished his term, 11 years later, 1863, uh, we had uh, over 500, probably closer to 600 students. So, he, you know, it was a mild graduated growth, but it was spectacular in terms of its time. Henry Tappan is best known, of course, for canvassing the rich men of Detroit to establish an observatory at the University of Michigan. He boasted about it. Uh, even after he'd been fired by the lame duck board of regents in 1863, that it was his great achievement and that nobody could doubt that it was an achievement of his own. It's called the Detroit Observatory and that always caused confusion, but it was named in honor of these men of Detroit who had funded the project. And it was one of the three great observatories of the world at the time it was built. It's still there up on the hill across from the uh, hospitals, corner of observatory and, uh, is it Ann or Catherine? Ann. Ann. Ann Street, yep. I think the uh, sculptor of this work is uh, Parducci, his name was Parducci. Um, other examples of Parducci's work can be seen on the uh, front of the Rackham building. Tappan irritated a lot of people in town. He, he was really the leader of society, being the president of the university, and yet he was con accused of putting on airs. Certainly these were legitimate if they were in, in existence at all. But uh, he had two or three enemies in the state. One of them was a local guy in Ann Arbor. One of them was the editor of the Detroit Free Press, Mr. Story, who turned out to be a Southern sympathizer when, we're, when the Civil War broke out. Tappan, of course, was famous for conducting a, a, uh, an assembly of the townspeople in 1861 when the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter. And he called a meeting at the courthouse lawn. There's a famous photograph that shows Tappan speaking Unfortunately, he's in the shadow under the uh, canopy on the courthouse lawn, so you can't really make out who he is, but there's a big crowd listening very attentively to him. And of course, they organized the local militia units, some of whom went off to fight in the Civil War. Tappan himself organized and uh, ran the uh, group called the Silver Grays, and that was because they had uh, gray hair. The, these were the old men of the town and they were really the home guard. And Tappan uh, participated in that group. But he favored the Prussian system of education, which he'd been studying while he lived in Germany and Switzerland. And uh, the locals didn't like this Prussianization of their state university. And uh, for various reasons, 
Uh, and of course, th this guy was part of the, the cause of his ouster. Uh, Rastus Otis Haven was a Methodist minister, and he objected to the fact that Tappan was a very sophisticated man, entertained at his house, the president's house on the university campus, and served wine at his table. <laughs> well, when Tappan was ousted by the lame duck board of regents, he ordered his family to pack up and leave town immediately, and they went off to Switzerland again, and he never returned to the United States. Even though the new board of regents gave some thought to asking him to return. Instead, they realized that his ouster was a fait accompli, and they appointed Erastus Otis Haven, a former member of the university faculty, uh, to come back and be the president. Haven served for only uh, six years, 63 to 69. And uh, according to the reports, his wife, and uh, I guess he as well, was shocked when they came to live in the president's house and discovered that the basement was full of wine bottles. <laughs> this was like having the devil living downstairs if you, if you were a Methodist at that time. Haven uh, eventually, and very soon, left the university again and became president of the new Northwestern University, just outside Chicago. And then finally fulfilled his life's ambition be, by becoming a bishop of the Methodist Church. This is Mr. Uh, Haven as depicted by Parducci in the law quadrangle. He looks like a very uh, unsympathetic, uh, not very humorous fellow. Have you all seen these gargoyles in the law quadrangle? It's certainly something you ought to know as an Ann Arbor local. This guy is my favorite, I think. Henry Simmons Fries, gentle professor of Latin, who lived in the wonderful uh, stone house. That's at 1547 Washtenaw, across from the corner where the big rock is at the Hill Street corner. It's set way back on the lawn. It's an Italianate, a gorgeous uh, Italianate uh, Tuscan villa kind of structure, uh, sort of cubic, as many of those Italian structures were, with, with the bracketed eaves and a cupola up on the roof. You can't miss it if you drive by, especially in the wintertime when the leaves don't mask it from the road. Well, Henry Simmons Fries was living there in this house that had been built only a few years earlier when he was asked to serve as the interim president of the university after Haven left to go to Northwestern. He was the leader of musical culture in Ann Arbor. He was an organizer of the Choral Union, which was composed of the, the uh, choirs of the various Protestant churches of Ann Arbor. They would combine in December to uh, put on a sing of the Messiah. The Choral Union eventually grew very quickly uh, into the uh, University Musical Society, which Fries also was instrumental in organizing. He was the organist at the Congregational Church, which was more or less the semi-official, at least, President's Church, because it was located since 1876. Um, come to think of it, he wasn't there in 1876, but uh, it was located on the corner of William and State. It's still there. There's a very nice uh, tomb for Mr. Freeze in the uh, Forest Hill Cemetery. It's based on an old Roman tomb that was on the side of the Appian Way. It's now inside St. Peter's uh, Museum in Rome protected there. And this copy of it uh, was subscribed by students who had tremendous affection for their old leader. When he died in 1889, they uh, pooled their money to build this nice monument to him. It's in the shape of a Roman bed, very appropriate for a teacher of Latin. <coughs> and he turned out to be the president, de facto at least, for three years. 
He had to serve until 1871 when the regents were finally able to persuade his successor, President James B. Angel, to leave the cushy surroundings, the civilized environment of the University of Vermont, and come out all the way here to the howling wilderness of Ann Arbor, which he very reluctantly did. There was, there's even a book called, uh, well, I, I forget what it's called, but it's a book of his letters to the regents of the university and the regents' letters to Angel, begging and wheedling and persuading and bargaining to bring him out here. And Angel, was his successor uh, as president, was there, and so was Marion Leroy Burton, who came in 18, or 1920. <laughs> Angel was here for 38 years as president. Enough of these three, three year and six year terms. Uh, Angel stuck to it. 1871 to 1909. He kept begging the regents to let him go, let him retire. He was 82 when he first begged to retire. I think they finally let him go when he was 82. He, he was a little younger than that when he first begged for, for the retirement. But the regents couldn't understand how the university would function without him. They'd never known another president, another leader. So they kept him in harness until 82. Then they let him retire and live in the president's house on the campus uh, for the rest of his life. Because luckily, his successor, the dean of the law school, Harry Burns Hutchins, didn't need to live on the campus. He already had his house on the corner of Monroe and Packard. It's burned down since, since he lived there. Here he is. This is uh, Harry Burns Hutchins. There's a picture of uh, President Angel's funeral cortege in 1916. When he died, the uh, president's house was converted to a Red Cross building. During, this was during uh, World War I. The U of M, or the uh, states weren't yet involved with the war, but they were getting ready for it. And uh, there was a lot of bandage rolling going on there and what had been the formal rooms of the president's house for a number of years. And then uh, Harry Burns Hutchins was presiding over the presidency, or over the university, but he lived on the corner of Packard and uh, Madison, I guess, or Monroe. Um, a little house that was right across the street from South Quad. When it burned down in the 1950s, uh, everybody in South Quad pitched in to, uh, to try to help the firemen quench the flames, but to no avail. Um, Hutchins had been dean of the law school. He, he actually came here as a student in 1871, the same year that Angel came as president. So they got to know each other very well. And Hutchins, during his administration, had the brilliant idea of asking uh, the uh, famous author of Cook on Corporations. He was an alumnus of the uh, University, William W. Cook, who had made millions of dollars with this famous law book. And he asked Cook to donate money for a dormitory. Well, he donated Martha Cook Dormitory. And then uh, he thought again, uh, maybe he had a little more money to spend on his alma mater. And he donated all the money to build the law school complex. That meant that the old law school building, which had been built under President Tappan, no longer was needed, for the law school at least, after uh, 1933 when Hutchins Hall was completed. And so uh, it was renamed Haven Hall in honor of the Methodist who had escaped to Northwestern years before. This is Hutchins here, and it shows him looking at blueprints because it was his idea to build the law school. And here he is as a gargoyle in the main entrance arch looking at the blueprints. 
before that building. His successor was Marion Leroy Burton. He'd been president of Smith College and got to know the uh, mayor of the town of Northampton, whose name was Calvin Coolidge. They struck up a friendship that lasted and continued even after Burton left Massachusetts to accept the presidency of the University of Minnesota, where he spent a few jolly years. There's a building at Minnesota named for him. And then uh, was lured away to come to the University of Michigan. Why? Well, he was comfortable enough at Minnesota, but he knew that the University of Michigan had the most loyal alumni group of any college in the United States. And uh, he thought he could do good work here. He was known as Burton the Builder because under his administration he was able to persuade the legislature to cough up the funds for several important buildings, including uh, Angel Hall, named for one of his predecessors. Here he is with the uh, the mallet that he used apparently to uh, to work on some of these projects in a personal way. Burton came in 1920. In 1924, he obtained the pinnacle of his renown, uh, nationally at least, uh, when Calvin Coolidge, remembering his old friend, asked him to nominate Coolidge for his second term. It was Actually, the second term was the, the first term for Coolidge. It was, he had already served out Harding's term. But uh, Burton said, sure. And he went to the convention in Cleveland, Ohio, and made a stellar speech, and was given a lot of ink in all the newspapers of the country. And then uh, four months, five months later, he suffered a massive heart attack, and he lingered near death in the president's house until February of 1925 when he expired. And again, there was a f big funeral procession. There's even a, a newsreel of Burton's funeral procession, which you can see online, um, made by the Detroit News, I think, back in 1925. Shows the hearse and the procession leaving the president's house on South University and heading down through the commercial district about to turn to go out to Forest Hill Cemetery where he's been ever since. In 1936, the Burton Memorial Tower designed by Albert Kahn was erected in his memory. Now, that's all the presidents, actually, that appeared as gargoyles because this guy, Clarence Cook Little, wasn't hired until after the law school was completed. It seemed to me a shame that although they've added a big new building just in the last few years, they didn't think to memorialize in that building uh, the successor presidents of the university. They, we got the first six in the, in the main archway. They could have added another six or seven or eight in this new building, but it never occurred to anybody, apparently. So they're, they're eventually going to slip into, uh, into uh, unconsciousness as far as the local public is concerned. But Clarence Cook Little came along, and it's now quarter past, and I'm told that this is a good time to stop. However, we'll go through some of the slides that turned up recently um, when the uh, Ann Arbor News, or Ann Arbor Library, posted the old Ann Arbor News photos online. Uh, they ran across a big file full of fires in Ann Arbor. And they've been posting those for the last couple of weeks. And here we have a famous building. I, maybe some of you recognize this building. <laughs> maybe some of you have worked on it in that building during the Saturday sales. It was on fire in 19, 
49, I think it was. It was the Sears Roebuck Warehouse at that time. And uh, that's really an old building to which the brick building was later attached. Here it is. Fireman on roof of Sears Roebuck Warehouse. There, there were three fires across the street at Montgomery Ward. You recognize that drive-in door? Here's the story from the Ann Arbor News. I guess it doesn't have a date on it, but I think if you look online, you can find the precise date of this clipping. December 49, yeah. Yes, but the, I think it was December 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. Here we are looking out west on Washington. These, these people in the corner are standing on the top of the old carport. Remember the one that was built in 1947? Mayor Brown's legacy. And there's the Kiwanis Activity Center off to the left. And across the street is the, uh, is the Montgomery Ward Warehouse, which also got blitzed several times. Here's the photograph from the uh, files of the uh, Ann Arbor News and the Ann Arbor District Library. And here's one that I really enjoy. It shows the, uh, the uh, Montgomery Ward Warehouse, the old uh, Almendinger Organ Company, Ann Arbor Piano Company building, but uh, it was actually taken at the fire in this building. And the guy on the fireman's ladder was Maitland Lamont of the uh, Ann Arbor News staff. He later became better known as the official photographer of the University of Michigan. He looks like he was having a great time getting up there with his speed graphic camera. And these guys down here are all identified in the caption. They're uh, officials of the fire department and also just well-known fire buffs of Ann Arbor. Bob Mulig may have been among them, I suppose. What's that? Ike Steiner, the photographer. Ike Steiner, yes. He was the photographer uh, hired before Maitland Lamont. Here are a bunch of firemen fighting the, that's it, they're, they're across the street. But in the background, you can see the Sears Warehouse, which is now the Qantas building. One of these guys apparently was overcome by smoke, and there's a photograph that shows him stretched out in the road there and being resuscitated. And that's the end of the foibles.